Well, as Lewis was saying, um, uh, I'm uh, from the University of Tennessee. I also have an affiliation with the um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and I hold a position at the University of Manchester. Um, I don't uh, go there very often, but I do occasionally uh, go there. Okay. So I want to keep this uh, informal in some sense. So if you have a question during the talk, ask it. It would be a great opportunity uh, to have some interchange uh, along the lines. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I've been to, I think, all of these, um, all of these uh, uh, events that have taken place, bringing in uh, people. And to be honest, I would rather be sitting in the audience for the two weeks. You've had a terrific lineup of speakers, and you're going to have some more really terrific speakers to hear from. So it's, uh, it's really an honor to be here, uh, being able to present to you. Uh, my, my slides are here. I guess they'll be posted on the right place at the right time, so you shouldn't have to worry too much about that. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about um, dense matrix problems. That's, that's really going to be the focus of this uh, hour. And uh, talking about solving systems of linear equations, least squares problems, and eigenvalue problems. And um, you know, linear algebra is a big source of computational problems uh, within uh, computational science. The kinds of problems we're talking about here are dense, so we're talking about problems which will take um, uh, order n cubed operations to solve. And uh, you know, these problems come up in various, uh, various areas and various uh, uh, modeling uh, 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 events or attempts. Um, there's a lot of software that's available for, uh, for these problems, and I've tried to put together a web page which collects together what I'll call freely available software. So there's a web page that's, um, that's here, which contains all the software that I know about that's freely available. So it can be used without concern, embedded within projects for the most, for the most part. There's licensing here that goes along with some of these things. And what I've tried to do is to express um, what kind of problems real complex, what kind of languages they're, they're written in, what kind of modes are they, that is, are they shared, shared parallel, do they have some accelerators, do they do distributed processing, do they look at dense problems, do they do sparse direct, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, the web page lists not only dense problems, but also sparse matrix problems, sparse eigenvalue problems. It, it looks at uh, tools that are used in computation. So that's a view that as a resource. From my standpoint, I'm, I've been around long enough to be, have my fingers in a number of projects. So um, uh, my, my, um, my career actually started at Argonne National Laboratory. And I worked on um, a project called um, uh, Ice Pack initially. Uh, but here we're interested in solving dense matrix problems and uh, we're going to be looking at the current packages, um, these packages here, they were designed actually in the last century. And we want to update those things, update them using the, the ideas and the, and the architectures that we have available to us today. Those packages are fine packages. They just don't, they just don't perform very well. That is, they're fine in the numerical sense. They'll give you the right answers. But from the standpoint of performance and extracting as much as we can out of machines today, those packages fall far behind. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so here's sort of uh, my, my life, my career on one slide. Um, uh, so I started uh, working on this project called Ice Pack uh, in the 70s. It was a translation of some ALGOL programs that came from uh, the thing we refer to as the handbook. It's a wilkinson Reinch handbook on linear algebra. Jim Wilkinson and Christian Reinch put together a collection of algorithms and that formed the basis for this package, Ice Pack, took those ALGOL programs and translated them into Fortran. It was a translation project trying to get it into a language that could be used on most machines that we had in the US. Uh, in the 80s, I was involved in something called LINPAC. You heard from Cleve Moeller about LINPAC a little bit uh, in his talk. And that was a project that we put together in the 80s. And um, it was looking at um, um, uh, level one blas operations, level one blas, vector operations. Vector computers were a big deal in the 80s, so that's, that's what the focus was. 
in the 90s, we took all of that software, IcePack and LinPack, and uh, fixed it so that it worked well on the machines or the architectures that were available at the time. And that was shared memory with caches. So we wanted things to be very good with um, data reuse and also with uh, expressing things with uh, shared memory as much as possible to extract some performance from that. Um, so that was in the 90s. Uh, Scalapack took those ideas and moved them into distributed computing. So message passing was the, was the model there. And all of that stuff has to be redone again for the machines that we have today. Multi-core changes everything again. And as we go to uh, many core and putting things together, all of that software base has to be changed. So there's a 10 year window for software basically here. Every 10 years, I'm prepared to rewrite everything, to embrace the new architectures and to adapt uh, to, those, um, to the changing landscape to get the most performance. And in the process of doing that, update the algorithms so that we use the best algorithms, state of the art algorithms that we have today. So that's sort of the, um, the, the if you will, the mold that we're going through uh, with, these, uh, with these packages. We're gonna talk about performance, and I wanna make sure we're all on the same page about that. So we're gonna talk about flops, so floating point operations. And whenever I talk about a floating point operation, I'm talking about 64-bit adds and multiplies. 64-bit, not, not 32 or 16-bit. And um, we, we're gonna be talking about theoretical peak performance. So the theoretical peak is based on uh, paper and pencil calculation, right? So you look at the cycle time, how many operations you do per cycle, how many cores you have, and that gives you the theoretical peak performance for the machine, sort of. So just as an example, a Skylake with 2.1 gigahertz, Skylake processors, one core, they can complete 32 floating point operations per cycle. 32 adds, and mul adds or multiplies per cycle. They finish. Each core does that. That's stunning. That's, that's incredible, right? 32 flops per core per cycle. At that, at that cycle time, that says that one core is 67 gigaflops. So one core of a Skylake is at 67 gigaflops. And if we have a socket of 32, sorry, 24 of them, we're up to 1.5 teraflops. So that's the theoretical peak performance for that chip, right? And our goal is to try to get as much of that as possible. So how can we do that? That's the first question we'd like to, we'd like to look at. And just, just in terms of what Intel's been doing to us. So this is sort of a, think of this as a little history here of Intel Xeon processors. So in the early days, um, Xeon processors, they did two flops per cycle per core. That's double precision. Single precision doubles that. You get, you get twice as many. Four, you get four flops out of that early days. In 2009, they, they doubled it to four flops. In 2011, they got eight flops. In, in 13 with Haswell, you got 16 flops. So today, with Skylake and Knight's Landing, each core is giving us 32 floating point operations per cycle per core. And single precision doubles that. Right, so that's a stunning amount of floating point capability there. So I would say these guys are over-provisioned for floating point, right? Knight's Landing has 68 cores, 68 times the cycle time times 32. That's a tremendous amount of floating point capability there. And we, we know we're going to have some trouble extracting that uh, from these processors. So here's, here's the problem. And um, you've heard that reiterated, I'm sure, by Jim Demmel and probably David Keyes. Um, it's about uh, data movement. So the latency in moving information around inside of our machines is tremendous. It takes 167 cycles to move data from memory to the place where it's gonna be used. 167 cycles. I said that on Knight's Landing, you know, you got 32 flops per cycle per core, and now I've gotta wait 167 cycles to get data to that, to that core. So that's a tremendous, um, tremendous penalty. So I could have uh, done over 2,500 flops in the time it takes to move that data from memory into the place where I'm gonna be uh, using that piece of information. So that's, that's the struggle we have. So I'm gonna take a, let's take a look at what happens and I'm gonna use a very simple model. We're gonna try to get a better handle on this. So we're gonna look at my laptop. So my laptop, um, 
uh, is a uh, Intel processor, it's Haswell. The cycle time is 2.3 gigahertz, 2.3 gigahertz. And it has something called Turbo Boost. So Turbo Boost is something that can happen automatically. I don't have to do anything. It'll raise the cycle time, 50%, if it can. So if the conditions are right, I'll get 50% boost in the cycle time. I don't have to do anything. I won't even know that that's happened, other than seeing a faster, faster rate. And that actually happens. So on my machine, 3.5 gigahertz, I can extract that. It's a Haswell processor, so I do 16 flops per cycle, double precision on this machine per core. So that says my laptop is at 56 gigaflops. That's the single core. I've got two of them. We're gonna look at just one core. So I've got a, I've got a uh, machine which has a CPU, it has cache, six megabytes of cache, and it has some memory, 16 uh, gigabytes of memory. And then I've gotta move data from memory to the cache. And that, that movement, that bus goes at 25 gigabytes per second. Right? That's just the hardware characteristics that I'm talking about. So um, we're gonna take a look at um, we're gonna take a look at the performance here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna forget about latency in, this, in, these, in these cases here. I'm gonna make things very big so I don't have to worry about latency. So let's take a look at some operations. So here's two common operations, uh, a DAXB and a DOT. DAXB and a DOT, so each of those operations, they take vectors of length n and they do something. DOT product, of course, multiplies them together component-wise and adds them up, and a, and a DAXB, takes a multiple, scalar multiple of one vector and adds it to another vector. So we've got, we've got two n floating point operations going on in both of these uh, cases here. And uh, we wanna see what the performance is on my laptop for these guys. And we're gonna use the model. So the model says, what I wanna do is again, reduce latency. So I'm gonna take vectors which are very large. So I take vectors which will fill up my cache. So in this case here, I'm taking vectors two two double precision vectors, they're of size three, 375,000, so very large vectors. I'm gonna do a dot product. So I've got this number of uh, data movement times eight, double precision. So I've got three megabytes per vector. Cache is six megabytes, so it fits up, fills cache just right. So the time it takes to move those two vectors to cache is given by this, right? So I've got six megabytes, 25 gigabytes per second, so it takes 0.23 milliseconds to move that data into, into cache. And then the time to do the floating point operations is given by this, two n flops times the performance I get, 56 gigaflops. So it takes 0 0.013 milliseconds to do, do the floating point operations. So data movement is far outweighing the floating point. Now, floating point's free in this case. Floating point is free. And let's say that we can overlap some of that. So let's just take the maximum of those two. So we're gonna take the time it takes to do that vector operation is 0.23 milliseconds. So 0.23 milliseconds says that that dot product is gonna run about three gigaflops. So that's the best performance I can get from that dot product. The best performance if data's coming from memory and the peak is 56. So I've just lost over an order of magnitude in performance over the theoretical peak by doing that vector operation. So if you do vector operations, there you are, that's the performance you'll get out of, your, out of your thing. So this is really communication bound. There's no reuse of data here. We read data in, we don't get to reuse it. It just is consumed by the floating point operations and we're done. We have three levels of blahs that we're gonna work with with dense problems. Level one, level two, and level three. Level two is matrix vector operations. Matrix vector says we're gonna do two n squared flops and we have n squared memory references. That, mem that matrix is the memory reference and it takes two n squared floating point operations to do that matrix vector product. So the, the ratio is two to one. So the ratio of floating point operations to memory is better than it was before. It was one to one before. So we would expect to get better performance, but not a lot better. And if we go to matrix matrix operations, we've got two n cube flops for a multiply and three n squared data movements. And we have to actually write something back. So there's four n squared uh, movements of data. So now the ratio of floating point operations becomes n to two. So that's a lot better. 
right? n to 2. We've got a surface to volume effect going on. So the surface is the data movement, and the volume is the floating point operations that I'm going to be doing. So that, that's a good one. So we should be able to do good there. But let's see what happens for matrix vector. So again, I'm going to make these things big enough to fill up cache. So I've got things big enough. The matrix size is 860. 860 in double precision fills up cache perfectly. So the time it takes to move six megabytes, that's the same. That hasn't changed, 0.23 milliseconds. The time to do the floating point operations, now I've got two n squared flops to do. So the time it takes to do that matrix vector multiply is given by 0 0.026 milliseconds. So again, it's rather insignificant to the time it takes to move the data. Data movement's you know, killing me here. So the performance now, if I think about taking the max there, the max then gives us the performance of six, about six gigaflops for this matrix vector operation. And again, the peak performance is at 56. So if you do matrix vector multiply and the matrix is dense, that's the peak performance that you're gonna get, right? So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind if you're going for high performance. And again, you know, we've got operations which are communication bound. We're struggling because we can't get the data to the place where it needs to be fast enough. Let's take a look at matrix multiply. So again, I'm making things so they fill up cache. I've got matrices of size 500. So I've got these three matrices that fills up our cache perfectly, six megabytes. So the time to move the data hasn't changed. That's still 0.23 milliseconds. The time to do those floating point operations, now I've got two n cubed floating point operations that I gotta do. And the peak performance, so that says the, the time to do the floating point now is much more significant, 4.5 milliseconds to do that multiply. So I'm spending more of my time doing floating point operations than moving data. So that's, a good, that's the good news. And the performance that I get, again, taking the maximum of those two, the performance says that I should get 55 gigaflops out of that. So I'm getting tremendous reuse of data. Now, now things are working as they should, 55 gigaflops of the performance there. Remember the dot product was about three, matrix vector was about six, and here I'm getting uh, roughly an order of magnitude greater, right, where everything is running on all cylinders basically to get us to that point. I've got surface to volume, I've got the data, and I've got the operations that I, that I need to perform on it. So this is what actually happens on my machine. So this is looking at those three operations on my laptop, looking at one core, looking at different sizes, looking at vector, doing vector operations, level one, level two, matrix vector operations, and then matrix multiply. So clearly we wanna be at the matrix multiply point in our algorithms. So if things are structured around matrix multiply, we have a chance of getting that performance. If you write algorithms which are doing vector things or matrix vector things, you're dead. Performance is here. So you've wasted all that, all that wonderful floating point hardware that they put in. So somehow that's what we're trying to struggle for with dense problems. Sparse problems, it's a hard story. It's harder to extract matrix matrix operations from sparse matrix problems. There are some, there are some mechanisms for doing that. But in the dense case, we want to try to get at that, that kind of performance. So that's our, that's our goal in, in, in this uh, story. Um, so, um, so I was using things that were perfect, that filled up cache perfectly. What if they don't fill up cache? What do we do in that case? How do we organize this? How do we structure things? What if we have matrices that are bigger than the cache? Well, then we think about blocking things. So we think about making things blocked so that they do fill cache. So we, we basically load in blocks of operations and do the operations on those blocks. So if you remember how matrix multiply is done, there's three loops, i, j, k loop, running around, you got these three indexes. Well, think of this now as six loops, where the innermost loops are doing a matrix multiply on a block, and the outer loops are running around the blocks. So instead of these being blocks, you can think of them as, as elements in, in the thing and do the operations on the elements. So that's, that's sort of what's done when we have too much data to be uh, to be expressed in that way. Okay, so um, in the 70s, we worked on this project called LINPAC, and LINPAC um, 
um, has various factorizations and, and looks at solving systems of linear equations. LINPAC was organized um, to do the factorization based on Gauss elimination with partial pivoting. And you know, the way we learned how to do it in high school is you take, you take a multiple of one row, subtract it from the other rows to introduce zeros down the column of the matrix. So that's exactly what this guy does. It takes multiples of this row, scales it by some factor, and that's based on these elements in the pivot, the pivot uh, uh, position, and then uh, it takes combinations of these rows is one way to think about it. Linpack said we're going to operate by column, though, because it was Fortran. Fortran stores things by column, so we knew that we can get things better if we organize things to go down, down the column, so that's this, exactly how it worked. And so it column-wise or orchestrated things. And if you think about, and it, it orchestrated things around the level one blahs. So the fundamental operation being done here is a Daxby. It takes a scalar multiple of this column and adds it to the other column. That's sort of the basic operation and it loops over that. So if I was looking at the program, there'd be a loop around this and there'd be a single thread and then be able to do these level one blahs. And these guys could be done in parallel. And then there's a synchronization point, then we go on. So that's sort of the structure for uh, the algorithm that we had in the 70s. And it worked okay. It moved too much data. Too much data is being communicated here. We could do a much better job. So that was um, modified. And um, uh, in the 80s, we rewrote all that software and turned it into software that was cache-based. So it basically looked at um, not reducing a column, but it went off on the side and reduced a panel of the matrix. It went off on the side, instead of just doing one column, introducing zeros in one column, it took this panel here and it figured out what it needed to do to introduce zeros in this panel, in this, to make it uh, uh, a trapezoidal of zeros, basically. And it took those transformations that it did and it applied it to the rest of the matrix. And the transformations, when in the application of those transformations, basically is a matrix matrix product. It's a, it's a um, Sure's complement. We're taking this matrix, multiplying it by this matrix, and updating this matrix here. That's the core operation in that factorization. So I've taken something that was a vector-based algorithm and changed it into something which is based on a matrix multiply. And now my performance has a chance of getting to the right point, as a chance of getting to a higher level. So um, these, these guys now are based on level three Blas operations. Same number of floating point operations, exactly the same number. Same error characteristics in terms of the uh, numerics of the thing. So we didn't lose anything along the way. We just got something which is gonna be better in terms of performance. And it was really aimed at machines that did uh, cache-based machines. But it had this notion of um, bulk synchronous processing. So there's a loop which runs around that does this. A loop that runs around and does it. So I've got a synchronization point. And we know that machines today have thousands, hundreds of thousands of cores. And if I'm going to use that machine at scale, having a synchronization point is a disaster. Right? I've got all these things running, and now I have to synchronize. I have to come together for one thing. So I don't want to do that. So that's going to be a problem in this algorithm, is that bulk synchronous processing that goes on there, that synchronization point. And I'm going to try to, what I want to do is to try to relieve that if possible. So this is the, uh, this is the LAPAC style. We've got... We've got matrix, matrix operations taking place. We go off on the side, we introduce zeros in a panel, we do some swapping to, uh, to maintain stability. We do a triangular solve, so this is a good guy. It's a, it's a matrix, matrix operation. Then we do a matrix multiply. This is the surest complement that we're computing. And then we go on to the next step of the method. That's a loop around that. And um, the way this works is we go, we're going to extract parallelism in these routines in the Blas routines. So LAPAC extracts parallelism by exploiting any parallelism that can occur at the lowest level. So at the lowest level, the matrix multiply can be parallelized. 
So we think of using Intel's MKL to do this, right? We say, it's your job to do that. So on a multi-core, on a many-core machine, the matrix multiply is done correctly. You know, they've implemented it so that it runs using as many cores as possible, and they get pretty good performance out of it. There's a guy at Intel called Goto. So Goto is the guy who writes all the blahs, the, the details of it. He's uh, sort of an expert in, in machine code, I think. As he, he's, he's done, you know, the previous, gen, all the generations I can remember, he's the guy who's implemented uh, uh, the BLAS operation. Does a superb job. It's hard to beat him. In fact, you know, it's hard to figure out what he's done to get that kind of performance. Really superb. Um, okay, so the story goes on. Uh, so that was LAPAC and Scalapack. We wanted to reuse that software. There's a lot of investment in software here. Distributed memory now is upon us in the, in the 90s. We have to do message passing. Right? So we, we have machines which have uh, MPI communication going on, and we want to um, take this and have it, have it run on those machines. So how do we, you know, how can we easily take our code and do that? I don't want to rewrite all my code. Writing an MPI is almost like writing at a very low level. And I don't want to write at a low level and expose that in my code. So I have to think about having some kind of abstraction here that does that, and um, uh, yeah, so distributed memory is the, the thing we do. So we created something called the parallel blahs. Parallel blahs lets us express the operations on the matrix as it's been distributed across the machine, and I'll be more specific in a moment. And underneath the parallel blahs, inside the parallel blahs, the, the actual blahs operations are done, the floating point arithmetic, and then we use the communication package called the Blacks. When, when Scala Pack was done, we didn't have MPI. We had, we had a number of message passing layers. We had something called PVM, that was something that was designed by four people in the mountains of Tennessee. And um, uh, MPI was just a twinkle in, in people's eye. Uh, Intel had their version, Argon had its version, uh, the guys at IBM had their own version, and the community said, this is crazy, we have to have one version, we have to have a standard. So the community got together and said, let's do MPI. And that's, that's how MPI basically we created. When this package was started, there was no MPI, we, there was nothing here, so we wrote a, a, a generic communication layer that could be plugged into anything. And today, of course, it's plugged into MPI. So these PBLAs are built on the BLAs and these communication layer. We have, we have our software that we designed that runs on shared memory machines, LAPAC, and we want it to run on distributed memory machines. With LAPAC, we think about the matrix. We think about pointing to an array which contains the matrix, and then we think about ways of addressing that. With with uh, Scalapack, the matrix is distributed, and we have to understand how the matrix gets distributed and what, uh, what's available to us. So what we want to do is to have those two, two parameters that describe the matrix itself. This quantity, the array, is the array on the local process that we're going to be using, and IA and JA are the references to the global matrix that we're going to be operating with. And then there's something called the descriptor. And that descriptor talks about how the matrix is actually decomposed across that collection of processors. So it's an um, object-oriented uh, version of, uh, of, of doing business, uh, basically. Uh, it allows us to quickly express uh, 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 a simple form of the operation into something which is now distributed and may uh, have a large number of processors involved. So just in terms of the stack, uh, Scalapack is written on top of these parallel blahs, which have global addressing, and then underneath is where all the local addressing takes place. It may, it may use LAPAC, it uses the blahs, it uses this communication layer here to effectively uh, drive the message passing uh, through, uh, through the course of, uh, of doing things. And the data has to be distributed somehow. Um, so we've got our matrix here. The original matrix, you know, we can think of as uh, a global structure, but it's going to be distributed across a set of processors. 
And um, we think about taking the matrix and, and uh, having blocks, having, think of them as tiles almost, for the matrix, and we're gonna be distributing those tiles to get effective performance across the algorithm when it runs. And um, uh, the way this is done, this is the global view of the matrix expressed in tiles, and this is the local view on a given process grid. So in this case here, we have a process grid which is two by three. So we have P by Q process grid. That's the way Scalapack works. That's independent of the hardware. That's, that, think of that as a virtualization of the machine that you have on the other side. And uh, we take those tiles and we distribute them across those processors in a way that ensures that we'll have uh, good performance throughout the course of the execution. So they are literally distributed in just that way, sort of round robin across, across the processors. So the first set of tiles get distributed across all the processors in just that way, and that carries on uh, throughout the course of the, um, uh, uh, throughout, throughout the whole matrix. So that on process 1-1, uh, one, one, it has a collection of tiles that come from around the matrix. And that's done to, again, ensure that we'll be able to uh, maintain performance throughout the course of the execution. I don't want a process to drop out too early, not having any work to do, so this will help ensure that uh, process 1-1 one, one has something to do way down here at the bottom of the matrix as well as at the top of the matrix throughout the course of the operations. And uh, it gets distributed like that. So the user's responsible for taking the matrix, distributing it in just that fashion, and then calling, launching the routine with that information provided to, um, to do the uh, factorization uh, for it. So somehow the data needs to get from this logical view into that uh, distributed view and carry on. And uh, the, within the course of Scalapack, uh, it's similar to LAPAC in terms of the uh, parallelism is this bulk synchronous kind of parallelism. So we go through phases where we do certain operations. We introduce zeros in a panel. We do some swapping. We do this triangular solve. We do a matrix multiply. And then we move on to the next step. Those things are repeated in, in the scalar pack algorithm. And uh, the operations, again, are across a set of nodes and uh, uh, underlying MPI processes uh, do the communication with that. One of the issues with Scalapack is that the communication and computation are done in separate phases. So there's a phase of doing the computation and a phase of doing the communication. And that's turning out, of course, not to be a good idea. You wanna be able to inter intermix those two things, have the computation and the communication uh, overlap so we can extract uh, additional uh, performance from that. And, uh, you know, I mentioned this business about bulk synchronous processing. We have to relax that. So this is a, this is a cartoon here of um, one of the factorizations in, in LAPAC. And you, know, you can think of it in the first step, we do something here to uh, introduce some zeros in a panel, do some operations on the matrix, and we can extract some parallelism perhaps in that. And then we move on to the next step and we do the same thing again. There's a synchronization point and move on to the next step. So we do something, we do something in parallel potentially, we synchronize, we do something in parallel, and we carry on with that kind of operation. So if we look at a cartoon of this performance on a shared memory machine, where we've got maybe 16 cores and time evolving, and the coloration here indicates that it's doing something productive, we see that synchronization point very clearly in the performance. So we're doing something very active, and then we have to synchronize, active and synchronize. So it's this fork join bulk synchronous processing, which is gonna kill us when we go to large numbers of processors. So we wanna change that in some way. And um, you know, the first step here is basically doing this kind of operation. It does something and then it spreads it across uh, all these guys here to do. And then we move on to the next step of the process. And then we move on to the next step. But we can effectively get started on the second step before the first step is fully finished. So as soon as, as soon as we've accomplished enough work here, we can start the second step, that is start that factorization. 
start working on that factorization. So as soon as this guy is done, this guy can get started. And these guys are still working, and this guy is active. So this guy gets a little priority in terms of his scheduling. This guy should go first in terms of doing business. And then these guys can start. And if we, if we organize things like that, we can effectively overlap and relax that synchronization point. So now things are more event driven. Things are more driven by the data. When the data is ready, things can go. So it looks more like a data flow model of computing. It looks more like a directed acyclic graph. So the computation now is actually, can be thought of as, as expressed in terms of a directed acyclic graph where the nodes of the computation, the arcs represent the dependencies, and the program is generating tasks with dependencies associated with it, and then a runtime system is taking that and executing it based on the dependencies that are there. So that's the model that we're going to. So that model, again, um, is, think of it as a data flow model. It does uh, some kind of fine grain parallel processing, where the, the, the operations that are going to be done are these BLAS operations. And we can take something which has a performance profile that looks something like this and reduce it to something which is trying to squeeze out that synchronization point. So we can relax that synchronization and get more, uh, get more performance. So that's what's going on today in the rewrite of the software that we have. So we're rewriting all that software and designing it in terms of this uh, data flow model. Rewriting it so that it can effectively uh, use um, the parallelism that's there. So we want to uh, get access to the, to the data as quickly as possible. So LAPAC organized the matrix in a Fortran centric way by column. The new software that we have organizes things by tiles. So you tell it a tile size and then you, you organize things so that things line up so that when I get access to one element, I have access to, I have easy access to the rest of the elements in that tile. So I don't have to sort of uh, go through it in a, in, in a staged uh, addressing way. So that effective, that, that speeds up some of the uh, data movement associated with, uh, with, the, uh, with the algorithm itself. So the LAPAC style uh, looked at a model which um, uh, had, a, had a, a, a diagram characterization that looked something like this where we operated on these panels or operated on large sub-blocks of the matrix. The new algorithms are working with tiles where we specify a tile size and then we do operations on those tiles and schedule those tiles according to the dependencies that arise in the algorithm. So it basically takes something um, that if you thought about it might look in a classical fork join model would look something like this where we do this operation then we're allowed to do these and then these. It, it, it sort of splits that into a way where we can uh, uh, squeeze more parallelism in and effectively do the thing uh, in a way that um, uh, would, would enhance uh, the overall performance. So this is a, um, a profile of one of the routines uh, in, um, this is LAPAC, uh, looking at uh, the performance here. The black things are the synchronization points that I was talking about where the processors are idle and uh, rewriting things in terms of, of uh, this directed acyclic graph uh, reduces that in a very uh, uh, significant way. You can see the, a lot of the black spaces are, are, are gone now. There's a few, a little bit still left and at the end you have to pay the price of shutting things down where there's not enough work to do. Uh, but if the matrix was bigger, of course, you wouldn't see that as much. And the performance gain is given by that, uh, by that margin there. That's on this, on this particular uh, size problem. Uh, things get better as you grow, grow the problem, grow the, number of, uh, grow the number of cores, of course. So we're taking algorithms, we're expressing them in terms of uh, data flow-like model, trying to enhance the overall execution, reduce the synchronization time, trying to um, uh, organize things based on matrix, matrix operations whenever possible uh, to extract the highest performance that we can. And we do this on shared memory machines in the context of OpenMP. So OpenMP today has a task model. We can, uh, we can structure the program uh, to do just that. And um, it lets us easily write the, system, write the program. And again, the way to think of this is the program is generating tasks. That's what the program's job is. 
the runtime system that OpenMP has takes those tasks and then launches them, la executes them on the underlying hardware. So that's, that's a good model to, to think about, a good separation of describing the work and then having the underlying runtime system do the operations. And this is the code that, that uh, evolves from that. This is a Cholesky decomposition. You know, we use OpenMP pragmas here to, um, uh, to affect that. Uh, uh, we define the inputs and outputs for the operations. Um, and then the runtime system that OpenMP has takes that and then schedules it uh, in, in a correct way. And does a pretty good job. Originally, OpenMP did not have this feature. So we wrote our own runtime system. So we're not, we're not runtime system people. So we hacked something together and it worked. It worked pretty good, uh, but this is, this is running, this is, does it better. So we're happy to use a standard uh, that gets it right and uh, uh, we can effectively fit in that space and uh, do our computations uh, across that. So these DAGs are, can get very large. So in a perfect world, I would take my directed acyclic graph and I would look for the critical path. What's the longest path in there? And when I want to execute that longest path first, is that frees up the most parallelism. But I don't have that luxury. That is, this, it doesn't work that way. I can't store the graph. In fact, the graph is never present. The graph is fleeting. It's just, it's going through the process. We generate tasks, the runtime system takes it, consumes it, and goes on with its work. We can give it hints as to which one it should do first, but we don't actually have that directed acyclic graph. So basically what we're doing is executing part of the DAG at a time. So we basically think of it as uh, we have a window of the DAG that's being executed. The runtime system is consuming those, those nodes and uh, scheduling them uh, on the underlying system. And it works pretty well. So this is a performance. The, this package is called Plasma that does this. Um, just to give you a, 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 so this is a Cholesky factorization. This is on an AMD with 48 cores. So it's a single board with 48 cores. We're looking at the performance for LAPAC on that. So this is LAPAC where we use a good implementation of the BLAS to try to extract performance. And that's the performance we get. MKL, they have their own version. This is even though it's running on AMD, they get, they get pretty good performance on this uh, particular uh, situation. And this is the plasma code that we've written that uh, can even do a little bit better in terms of the performance on that, uh, on that particular node. So uh, this, is, this is the way the, um, the, the code is being structured today for Plasma, which is a shared memory implementation of these things. Now in a library setting, we occasionally want to put together routines uh, to do something. So I want to have uh, a bunch of routines stuck together uh, to accomplish uh, what I need to do. In this particular case, um, I'm going to compute the in explicit inverse of a matrix. So usually you don't, you don't compute the explicit inverse. This is, uh, this is, here we're computing the variance covariance matrix. So it's a st statistical thing that's needed to look at the elements of the inverse. And the way we do that is we think about factoring the matrix, taking the matrix and computing its Cholesky factors. The matrix is symmetric and positive definite. And then we take another routine to compute the inverse of one of those factors. And then we take a routine that multiplies those two guys together to get the inverse, explicit inverse of the matrix. So I call three routines to do that. Each of those routines are done using this data flow representation and model. We're trying to squeeze out as much as we can. Uh, at the beginning, you suffer a little bit. At the end, you suffer because there's not enough work to do. And that's true for all these methods here. And, you know, there's DAGs that represent uh, each, of these, each of these kind of computations and um, uh, the DAG, the DAG uh, uh, length is given by uh, something uh, that looks like uh, this where uh, T is uh, uh, some measure of the uh, tiles. So, um, so that's the performance graph that we get out of it. But we're in a situation where we're scheduling tasks. So we, we're in a situation where one routine is generating tasks, and then another routine starts generating tasks as well. And those things can be overlapped. That is, one routine generates tasks, and the second routine can start generating tasks, and the third routine. So they sort of can be combined. Yeah. Oh. So you've run these on a bunch of different architectures. So we do. How much effort to really get this level of performance on, like this KNL? Um, 
well, uh, so once the, once the code is written, well, we would claim that it gets good performance across a class of architectures. So it runs on KNL, it would run on Intel processors, uh, which were not uh, KNL based, it would run on uh, AMD things, it would run on IBM stuff, it would run on uh, Fujitsu machines, it would run on uh, the Tianhu Lite. So all those machines it would run on, as long as the blahs are implemented, right? And uh, as long as it has OpenMP, as long as you know, all, the, all those uh, layers are in place, then this software is gonna run pretty well on those, on those machines. So you don't have to do anything, is the bottom line, as long as those, those layers are there. The code is designed to be as portable as possible in that setting. Again, this is for shared memory stuff I'm talking about. And um, um, because we're in a library setting, we have these three routines, they can be, the, the tasks can flow from one to the other. That is, um, I, of course I have to, I'm generating tasks, but the runtime system can generate tasks for the three routines, um, one after the other, before the first one is finished, execution. And when you do that, you end up with a, with a computation which is much more compressed. So again, you know, at the, we have to shut down here for this routine before the next routine starts, but that can be compressed in. And the same thing here, the startup and shutdown can all be overlapped. The directed acyclic graph looks a little bit different and the, the length of the graph is actually changed in this case here, so we get a much more compressed view of that. So writing things in this way allows us to express the algorithms in a much more compact form and allowing better, uh, better performance uh, between, those, uh, between those two routines, between the two ways of doing the routines. So again, we're taking routines and combining them to accomplish a greater task. We can do that in a way which overlaps the operations within it and getting much better execution overall. So um, the story that we have today uh, talks about uh, a few things. One, one is, um, one is plasma. Plasma is the thing which works on shared memory machines. Magma is a package that works on accelerators. It runs on accelerators. So think of the dense linear algebra that we're talking about here running on a machine which is accelerator based. And trying to split the computation between the multi-core part and the accelerator part of the machine. So think about um, a machine like uh, uh, you know, Intel and uh, uh, NVIDIA based system. Uh, think about uh, the machine Titan. Think about uh, those kind of machines. That's what Magma is targeted at. The same ideas I've talked about expressed at that, at that level. The package dplasma is taking those ideas and putting distributed computing in place. So working with distributed memory on those things. Think of these packages in some sense as a prototype. These are prototype packages. This is the package that we're working on today. It's called Slate. It's, um, it's, it's under the, the Department of Energy's Exascale Computing Program, and it's designing a, um, a, a linear algebra, dense linear algebra package, which will fit on the architectures that DOE is planning for. So the machines that you've heard about, uh, this, this package is being designed for that. It's, uh, again, hybrid, it'll be based so it can run on hybrid systems that is multi-core plus some kind of accelerator. It'll be uh, C++ based. It's gonna be updated to use the state of the art algorithms. And again, it's that 10 year cycle that we're going through rewriting that software to effectively uh, use and to exploit uh, the architectures that we have there. Um, one of the things that uh, we see uh, over and over again is a need for small matrix operations. That is operations that are occurring on matrices of small sizes. So I've talked about large matrices and extracting performance from those. The, the question here is, um, what can we do to extract performance from, from small matrices? So where do these uh, small matrices come up? Um, well, let, let me first say that um, uh, this is the curve I showed earlier. This is of a uh, Knight's Landing. This is looking at level one, two, and three blahs operations on Knight's Landing. So again, um, you know, you, this is vector operations. This is matrix vector and this is matrix multiply. So you see the, again, that extreme range there in performance. If you have vector operations, uh, you know, you're, you're stuck. If you have matrix vector operations, you know, you don't get much better. You really wanna be at this level here. And just so it's clear, 
I can write matrix multiply in terms of this operation here, and this is the performance I would get if I did that. So you really need to think about writing it so that it's using the data structure correctly, and similarly with the matrix vector, matrix vector products. But uh, we're interested in small matrices, so there's a factor of 35, but we're interested in matrices at this range here. What happens uh, if I have a lots of matrices here? What can I do? Um, uh, one of the issues at, this, at these small matrices is there may not be enough work for the cores that I have on my chip. So if I have 68 cores and I have a matrix of size 50, there's not enough work for those 68 cores. So I'm gonna be wasting you know, some of the computational potential. And um, you know, I wanna be able to address that. And we see this coming up over and over again. So machine learning, uh, deep, deep learning, um, you know, it's driven by matrix multiply. You probably heard Rick Stevens talk uh, about that. And uh, you know, the kernel there is doing matrix multiply operations. They're done in parallel, lots of them, on small matrices. In fact, the precision is probably not 64-bit, it's probably 16-bit. But that, that's another story. So you know, what can we do to accelerate the performance when we have this situation? Or um, uh, you know, it, comes up, it comes up in our matrix, dense matrix computations as well. We're expressing things in terms of tiles. It comes up in sparse direct methods where they have a multifrontal scheme and they develop these fronts of dense matrices. And those are small dense matrices. And all these things can be done in parallel. So the situation we're faced with is I've got, a, I've got a large number of small matrix operations to do that can be done in parallel. And you know, the way the first approach would be to write a loop around a Blas operation to do that. But then if I did that, I'd be wasting the potential of the performance because I can't extract, I can't use all the cores effectively. So what I want to do is to, instead of writing a loop around each of those matrix multiplies, what I want to do is to batch them up. So think about calling one routine with, um, let's say, 500 matrices to be multiplied together, independent matrices to be multiplied, matrix multiplies to be done, 500 of them. So I call one routine which identifies the data and the number and the uh, sizes and have the underlying system then schedule them appropriately on the hardware that's available. So that's, uh, that's something which uh, people are finding very attractive, not only for doing the BLAS operations, but even raising that up a higher level and doing other operations uh, in this batched, uh, batched form. And uh, you know, the, things that, the kind of performance we see, again, is, is quite impressive. This is looking at uh, 4,000 matrices, all of these sizes, size 32, 64, 96. So I've got that kind of um, matrix problem. And um, this is the performance I see if I run, run one right after the other, have a loop around it. So I've got, uh, got 4,000 matrices of size 32. The performance I see out of that is at this point here, where if I batch them together, I can get a higher level of performance. I get more effective use of the cores and uh, that, uh, that carries on. At some point, of course, those two things cross, and if the matrix gets big enough, uh, these routines here would be much more effective. But for small size matrices, I can extract performance in a very effective, very effective way. So there's a, there's, a, there's a community effort today to develop a standard for, for doing that. Okay, so here's, here's sort of the critical things I see uh, in terms of um, uh, exascale computing. Um, synchronization reducing. We have to have some way of breaking that fork join bulk synchronous processing. And uh, data flow model is one example of, of a way to do that. It's quite effective in doing it. We're gonna carry that forward uh, with, our, with our computations. Uh, communication reducing. You know, Jim Demmel stressed that, I would guess, and, and David Keyes uh, echoed it in his talk about the, uh, the effects of communication. Coming up with algorithms that, uh, that can be expressed in terms of the minimum communication uh, for that particular algorithm and implementing that. And we have some very good examples of that uh, today. So reducing the communication is critical. Reducing synchronization is another critical thing. Using mixed precision. So single and double precision. There's a factor of two single and double. 
And now we have 16-bit floating point, if you can get away with it, right? Uh, so 16-bit's four times the performance of 64-bit. Uh, so think about mixing the precision. So we've have, we have examples where we can start something with a lower precision and start to converge with it and then switch to a higher precision to drive the convergence to the accuracy that we want. There's a number of examples of that in the dense world as well as the sparse world where that can be applied and performance can be, uh, can be gained from, from doing that. And we're starting to understand what the limits are of 16-bit. You know, the hardware is going to be driven by deep learning. They're going, to have this, they're going to have this kind of floating point arithmetic going on in it. The question is, can we effectively use it for large-scale scientific uh, computing? Um, Auto-tuning is critical, right? So tuning for high performance is a complicated thing, and I have to build it into my software. I have to build it into the software to effectively... Uh, arranged so that it can adjust to the dynamics that are going on in the machine and somehow make effective use of all of the uh, hardware that's available to us. And today we're experimenting with um, auto-tuning for, um, for power consumption. We can tell if something is communication bound. If it's communication bound, reduce the frequency of the processor, reduce the power consumption, and still have the same performance. That's the goal. And we're trying to build that into the software so the user doesn't have to worry about it. We want to be able to resist failures. So this is a big deal on machines. You know, failures are an option here. What happens if we lose a process or a bit flips? Can we detect that in the software and take some corrective action? You know, today MPI is sort of crippled because of its lack of fault tolerance in some sense. And uh, that'll be changed, I hope. Uh, but, you know, these are, these are important issues that have to be addressed, I think, in terms of the long run for machines which have hundreds of thousands of uh, processors. And I am out of time now. And the last thing is about reproducibility. So there's this notion that uh, we have machines which are deterministic. They should give us the same answer, running the same problem on the same machine today and tomorrow, and that's not true. We lost reproducibility when we went to parallel. Parallel, I can't guarantee the way collective operations perform. Or, 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 or are working. And because I can't uh, guarantee that, uh, I won't have reproducibility. And some people demand reproducibility. You know, I'm a numerical guy, I can give you an error bound, and I'm happy with the error bound. But, you know, to be honest, if I'm debugging a program, I want to get the same answer today and tomorrow, otherwise I'll just be confused about where the errors are. So that's, uh, that's the end of my story. Um, I think I took probably a little bit more time than I should have. Um, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're in debt to a large group of people here, Department of Energy, NSF are our major providers, and we get uh, funding from, we get help from uh, anybody who's willing to give it to us. Um, I have colleagues, uh, colleagues around the world who have collaborated in this work, and I'm happy to answer any questions if, uh, if there's time. Thanks. So we do have time for a question while our next uh, speaker is getting set up. Thank you so much, Jack. Yes. Uh, what is the responsibility of the programmer? Is the architecture's advanced to do the domain decomposition, like to come up with the appropriate tiling and whatnot? Right. So um, you know, in this case here, um, uh, we certainly give hints. Hints. What's the best? What's the best way to do it? You have a matrix of this this size here. Here's the best way to orchestrate it. Here's the best way to decompose it. Here's the best tile size to use for a given uh, for a given uh, situation. And um, if if it's a more complicated thing, um, uh, it becomes harder. But you know, we do give hints, and in some cases, we have programs which actually do it. Um, so so there are ways of doing it. You're not left to, to the discretion. Um, you're, not, you're not just left out in the field to do it. Yeah. And another question? Yes. So are you uh, planning on using the, your current um, thinking for changing at all like, things like the HPL, um, your HPL implementation? HPL, okay. So uh, HPL is the Linpack benchmark. Um, HPL uh, has a life of its own. There's a whole story or another lecture there or talk to give. Um, uh, so uh, HPL, is, um, HPL is the Linpack benchmark. It's the prototype for the benchmark. So it's a code that was written which says this is an implementation of, of the benchmark. You can run this on your machine and get it. Uh, we provide a harness so you can replace that uh, and, and optimize it in a certain way. H, uh, the, the top 500 Linpack benchmark, you have to do Gauss elimination with partial pivoting. That's the, that's the algorithm you use 
how you implement that algorithm you can change. So all the stuff I've talked about here will have an impact on the implementation and you could implement things in a certain way. We have not changed HPL um, over the years, but it is possible to do. Yeah. You mentioned 16-bit because of the deep learning machines. I had the impression with the analog devices that they're planning on using that 16 bits was, would be a, few, a distant future dream for accuracy. Wow. Okay, they're here today. <laughs> we have machines that do it now. Two, I mean, the two analog switches? No, no, no. These, these are hardware floating point. There's an IEEE standard for 16-bit floating point arithmetic. Uh, Intel, NVIDIA, uh, AMD all have products. Um, uh, uh, we're using them today. But, but for the things where they want to get the power usage down, they want to go to these analog switches. Oh, I see. And, and those do not, you know, 16-bit would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not sure about the analog switching uh, aspect of this, yes. But th they're here today. The power consumption is, is, is great. It's uh, four times the performance of single precision um, if you can use it. The range is pretty short. You got issues with underflow, overflow uh, in, in the extreme now. And, um, but there are, uh, we can point to examples where it works and you get remarkable results.